Hello, I'm Dr. Ahmed Abdelal, and this is the second uh, part of the anatomy and physiology of phonation, or the anatomy and physiology of how to produce voice, how to make the vocal folds vibrate to produce a buzz that we can use to generate uh, speech eventually. So if you look at the laryngeal inlet and the position of the larynx, you will see that the vocal folds are V-shaped when they, they have a, an opening in between them, that's called the glottis. And here you have one vocal fold on one side and the other vocal fold. And then there is nothing, no opening for the air except for the glottis. So the entire airway is valved by the vocal folds. This is obviously the uh, breathing mode, uh, I'm sorry, the, the speech mode, uh, where you have the two, two little arytenoids here, adducted, coming together, and each one has a vocal fold tied to it. And when the, the two arytenoids come together, rotate and come together, they bring the vocal folds to the midline. So you can see on um, above the vocal folds, you can see the epiglottis, epiglottis uh, that's a cartilage, that acts like a drawbridge. So the vocal folds will be here. And then uh, food and liquid and stuff will be coming as you eat will be coming from this side and the vocal folds will be here. So the as soon as you start to swallow, the epiglottis is going to tip over the vocal folds and it will, it will protect them. At the same time, the vocal folds will be sealed shut. So you have double the protection and then the epiglottis will be above them. And then the food and liquid will go over it. There are two grooves on top of it, and the food and liquid will go into the pharynx and then to your esophagus. Uh, in order for the epiglottis to, to be stable and to, to have something to, to sit on when it comes down uh, to close, you have the airy epiglottic folds on either side. These are like two little walls uh, membrane, membranes actually that end up um, with a, a a border, thick border on top, and that when the uh, epiglottis comes to to kind of sit on, it will sit on each one on one side. It gives it a place to to land on, so that like a you know like support for a bridge, and then in addition you have the uh, arytenoid cartilages here. On top of each arytenoid, there are the little craniculate cartilages that are like two little pieces of corn sitting on top of each uh, one on each of one arytenoid. So this way, the epiglottis is going to sit uh, on on them also as well. So this will give stability. There are also the coniform cartilages that are that are. Uh, on this part here, uh, next to the airy epiglottic folds, they are buried on the on the rim here. So this behind the epiglottis is the back of the tongue. Um, you could see that, for example, if you try to guess what is this the front or the back, always keep in mind that. The vocal folds are together. See how it is V. That V where the vocal folds originate, they do not move here. They just originate on the thyroid cartilage. And that is anterior. So when you look here where the epiglottis is, that is anterior. And this is the tongue. So the person is looking this way. And then posterior is, you, you, you will find that the arytenoid cartilages are uh, in the posterior end of the larynx. I uh, added another image to this one, um, so I hope it doesn't disorient you. Uh, here we have a coronal view 
of the larynx, whereby, so you have two vocal folds like this and you split the, the larynx. Um, actually, uh, you split the, the larynx coronally this way so that you have, uh, you cut each vocal fold, uh, a cross section of each vocal fold. And then you can see the, the space between the vocal folds here. Uh, you can see that space, the, the glottal space. And we said here's the subglottic space and here's the supraglottic space. I wanted to show you um, a view of both vocal folds uh, at the same time so that you will see how the ventricular folds are in relationship to the true vocal folds. So here are the true vocal folds here. And right above them, you can see the ventricular folds. You can see that, you know, how they are here and here. And they extend the same, all the, like the same length and from, uh, from end to end, just like the true vocal folds. However, the ventricular folds are thick and they are not made to vibrate. They only vibrate under extreme conditions. And when the person uh, has a habit of vibrating them, that will lead to a voice disorder because there will be extreme tension and stress on the entire neck area. And that will eventually um, lead to um, hyperfunctional use uh, of voice. And we said that the function of the ventricular folds is to produce, uh, actually to give you another layer of protection if you have to force the air wash up, but um, it, uh, they produce mucus and they drip the mucus on top of the uh, true vocal folds to keep them moist and all the time. If the vocal folds uh, lose that moisture, the person will develop a voice disorder because they, the vocal folds are constantly slamming against each other and we do this millions of times throughout the day. And if you do not keep them hydrated and moist, then that is a recipe for developing voice disorders like little calluses and, um, and cysts and all kinds of problems that can result from that. So now <clears throat> we are going to look at the mechanisms, number one that will enable the larynx to stay stable inside of the neck, that will enable the larynx to be elevated and to be pulled forward when you swallow, for example, um, or uh, to be pulled down back to where it is, where it is supposed to be. Um, so you notice, uh, for example, when you swallow, you can put your index finger on your larynx and you swallow the larynx has two movements at once it will go up and forward and the reason here's the epiglottis and here is the you know say the the, the, the vocal force when you when you elevate the larynx you kind of push it far away to the front so that the epiglottis can cover it more you know uh, can give it more coverage. So you are protecting, kind of hiding the, you know, uh, to some extent, hiding the vocal folds away from uh, food and liquid as that comes down. But another thing happens is, um, is you know, as the larynx is, is positioned like this, there are the muscles that are from above it that anchor it and can pull it up and forward. These muscles sometimes uh, under stress and tension, the person um, who has anxiety would, would contract a lot of muscles in their body and these become tense. So the muscles above the larynx may become tense as well. I'm pulling the larynx up and, and kind of make, in addition, making the, the, the vocal folds longer involuntarily. And when the person speaks, they speak in a high pitch when they have a meeting that they are nervous about or, uh, or um, they are highly excited. Or, but especially if they are, have anxiety, 
you would see you'll hear that as a very high pitch in their voice that is because of the involuntary contraction of the suprahyoid muscles as they pull the larynx up and forward and also the, in some, the intrinsic muscles as they act on the mechanisms that stretch the vocal folds and make them tense. We'll discuss that in detail in the uh, in time as, as we move on. So you have two sets of laryngeal muscles. One set has to do with holding, holding the larynx inside of the neck and making it stable so that it can be, um, uh, these muscles are responsible for the heavy lifting of the larynx and for anchoring it and keeping it in place. So two functions. The extrinsic laryngeal muscles have two major functions. One of them is to keep the larynx positioned inside of the neck in a stable manner so that it can be anchored and fixed in place. And number two is to elevate or to depress the larynx. And, you know, depression of the larynx and elevation are functions that we need in order to survive, to swallow, for example, or to cough or, you know, other functions, biological functions. You notice here that I did not refer to speech production. Uh, to extrinsic laryngeal muscles do not contribute directly to phonation so the the ones that contribute to the adjustment and movement of the vocal folds these are intrinsic laryngeal muscles so another uh, difference i wanted to point between extrinsic and laryngeal and, and intrinsic laryngeal muscles is that when you say extrinsic you focus on the um on the points of attachment. When you say extrinsic laryngeal muscles, it means these are a, this is a set of muscles, four on top and four below the hyoid bone. And these, um, these muscles are called extrinsic because they have one attachment outside of the larynx and one attachment inside or on the larynx. Mostly, the origin origin is mostly outside of the larynx, and the insertion is on the larynx because the origin, for example, will be above for the suprahyoid muscles. So when the contraction, thing, when these muscles contract, they will pull toward their origin, and their origin is above. So as a result, the whole larynx is lifted up and also forward. So then. So these uh, uh, muscles, again, have one attachment out of the larynx and one attachment onto the larynx. So as far as intrinsic laryngeal muscles, these muscles have both insertion and attachment, or uh, I'm sorry, origin and insertion onto the larynx itself. Okay, and these intrinsic muscles that we will discuss later they are responsible directly for moving the vocal folds into adduction and abduction and for adjusting their length to produce high or low pitch. So I use uh, the acronym DSMG for, um, I use that for the extrinsic uh, laryngeal muscles, which are the suprahyoid muscles, DSMG, and the, these particularly are the four muscles that um, lie above the hyoid bone, and they have insertions above, and they, I mean, I'm sorry, they have origins above the hyoid bone, and they come down to insert onto um, the hyoid uh, bone, um, and they elevate the larynx. So we said, if you recall, the hyoid bone is, is the only bone in the larynx, and the entire larynx is attached to the hyoid bone. And the hyoid bone serves as a point of uh, insertion for many muscles above and below it. So these are, you notice, for example, that 
the suprahyoid muscles are three of them and the pyoid, hyoid, hyoid. And I mentioned before that a muscle, typically a muscle or most muscles have, have a name that is composed of two different uh, names. So here, for example, stylo and then hyoid. Milo, hyoid. Genio, hyoid. So the first part of the name points to the origin. And we said it's important to do the, to, to point to the origin because muscles can contract only towards the origin. When they contract, they pull the organ or, or they pull the organ to which they are inserted. They pull it toward the point of insertion. So if you do not know the insertion point, uh, the, um, I'm sorry, the origin, they pull toward the point of origin. If you do not know the point of the, of origin, you would not be able to understand in what direction the the muscle will be moving the structure so the digastric that di means two gastric means belly has to do with belly and that is a muscle that is like has two bellies so the first this is the muscle that you see first belly is uh, it it, um, it originates on the inf interior interiors on the anterior surface of the chin bone on on the lateral interior surface of the chin bone and it courses it courses posteriorly and inferiorly slightly and then it kind of goes there is a tendon uh, i'm sorry ligament on the hyoid bone you can see it tendon this acts like it's like a tunnel so as the anterior belly of the digastric uh, approaches the tendon on the hyoid uh, it, it it turns into a um, tendon it, as you see that whitish area here it's a tendon it's more tough and that tendon goes under the under the ligament of the hyoid and emerges on the other side as another tendon and that tendon then leads to the other part of the muscle that is the posterior belly you can see it here more clearly see here's the anterior belly and here's the tendon the tendon continues to be also continue with the posterior belly and then then you go to the posterior belly and then you have the the um the other attachment on this end so this muscle in reality has two kinds of points of attachment so but it can say it is considered as one muscle the anterior belly of the digastric and the posterior belly of the digastric digastric do not confuse it with the muscle this muscle that's next to it this is the stylohyoid it's a whole different muscle so, but you could see clearly this tendon, this um, ligament on the hyoid bone is the ligament for the digastric. So this way, when the digastric, you know, this is the digastric goes here. When the two sides of the digastric muscle contract or one of them, they are going to elevate the larynx. Or if the anterior one contracts more, it will pull the larynx forward. So let's look at these. So the functions of the suprahyoid muscles, uh, these four, is to elevate and the larynx and to stabilize it, to keep it in its place and stable, and then you know to elevate it for swallowing purposes or for you know, other biological functions. So here is the uh, you can see the um, digastric here and it comes it course the posterior belly courses empty um, anteriorly and inferiorly toward the hyoid bone it goes under the uh, ten, the uh, ligament of the hyoid and it goes um, re-emerges on the other side and then continues uh, with the tendon of the anterior belly of the digastric Um, the stylohyoid 
is the muscle that's next to it. Here is a little process of uh, coming out of the temporal bone, little process here, that's called the styloid process, a very, very tiny tip of bone, like very small, like the tip of the, of the pen like this. And out of it, three muscles come down. Uh, this is one of them. So this muscle, because it originates on the styloid process, we call it the stylo. So, and then it goes down to the hyoid and then inserts onto the hyoid. So we call it the stylohyoid. So now you can imagine there's, of course, this, all these muscles are paired, you know, one branch on one side. So when these two muscles contract, you can imagine that they are going to lift up the larynx, going to lift it up and a little bit posteriorly. Uh, but if they lift up, in the same time as the, the anterior muscles here, that is going to lift up in a symmetrical way, just up. And, and we, the move, different movements of the larynx depend on what functions we are trying to perform. So here's the stylohyoid, stylohyoid and, and the uh, digastric belly, uh, the, uh, the uh, posterior belly of the digastric and the anterior belly of the digastric. So what is what are the other ones? We said D, digastric. Um, S, stylo, digastric stylohyoid. D S M M mylohyoid, and then so that is the um, the mylohyoid. This is the muscle that is here. It basically contributes to making part of the floor of the mouth, and it's like a triangle. You can see the the origin here on the la inferior lateral margins of the mandible, and it, it, the the muscle fibers course um, medially and and posteriorly, as you could see here, and they insert onto the hyoid bone. This like triangle kind of muscle here, um, and you can see the lateral view of it. So the one segment here and one here, the digastric. And then you have the uh, geniohyoid. Genio, gin, chin, the word chin, genio, and then hyoid. So this muscle originates on the anterior surface of the chin bone, and it courses posteriorly and inferiorly to insert onto the hyoid bone geniohyoid. Now you can imagine what this muscle does when it contracts it's gonna so it is going like this and here's the hyoid. It will pull the hyoid in two different ways contracting up and anteriorly and this is why when you swallow your larynx is gonna be pulled up and anteriorly. So the um, here is a um, a table that shows you the the origin of a muscle, the insertion, the innervation, what nerve innervates it, and the action. And it will be important to know the this information. Here is a website that's going to give you an animated view of each muscle and what exactly how it moves and you have more information about that. The intrinsic laryngeal muscles, uh, I use the acronym uh, TOSS, T-O-S-S, -S, which mean, um, you can use your own acronym, of course, but I just find this one easy to remember. So um, these are four muscles that are, um, that are the um, actually uh, uh, infrahyoid muscles. Um, these are also four. So the T is for thyroid, it's a thyrohyoid, and then we have amohyoid, sternothyroid, and then sternohyoid. So again, four extrinsic laryngeal muscles that are suprahyoid, and then four extrinsic laryngeal muscles that are infrahyoid. And, and the infrahyoids are the TOSS, Acronyms. I think I made a mistake. I mentioned I referred to them uh, as uh, intrinsic, but that was a mistake. 
So the functions, all of these infrahyoid muscles originate below the level of the hyoid and they insert, all of them insert onto the hyoid uh, bone. And when they contract, they're gonna pull down the hyoid, uh, uh, which means they will pull the whole larynx down. So they provide support and they also depress the larynx. Uh, let's look at this. We said, um, we said T, thyrohyoid. So the first part has to do with the, with the origin. So thyro means you look for the thyroid. So here's the thyroid and uh, on the lateral inferior margins of the thyroid, the muscle originates and courses superiorly to insert onto the lateral inferior margins of the hyoid bone. Here's one, and on the other side, there should be another one, but it's not showing. Thyrohyoid. So when this contracts, it will pull down the hyoid, it will pull it down to narrow this little space here. So what it does, it narrows the space between the hyoid and the thyroid cartilage. Thyrohyoid. Then we have, again, toss, O, amo, hyoid. The clavicle here is part of the, the shoulder. The, this muscle originates on, um, uh, the, um, on the shoulder bone and it courses beneath the clavicle and then it courses superiorly and medially as it goes, um, as it goes uh, up, uh, it is going to, to turn into a tendon and then it will course uh, superiorly to insert onto the hyoid bone. So amo, uh, um, uh, amo hyoid, it, it, is, it has two bellies. It has a, an inferior belly and a superior belly. So again, when it contracts, it's going to pull the larynx down. But in addition to this function, it contributes to stabilizing the larynx. And then we have, so uh, the S and S. Uh, S stands for sterno. So you have here the sternum, the top of the sternum, that's uh, the uh, manubrium sterni. Uh, and on the lateral superior margins, of the manubrium, uh, the muscle, the sternohyoid originates on either side. And of course it's uh, superior, you can see this, this is not the one. It is, this is the one I'm speaking of. The, actually the, the sternothyroid and then the sternohyoid is one. So this muscle courses superiorly to insert on two the inferior margin, inferior lateral margins of the thyroid, the thyro, I'm sorry, the sternothyroid. And the other one, the sternohyoid, you can see it uh, on the other side on the left, that is the muscle uh, on the sternum, and it goes up to insert onto the hyoid. So you have the sternothyroid and the sternohyoid. Both of these are um, inferior, uh, inferior or infrahyoid muscles. So the, again, collectively, these infrahyoid muscles uh, stabilize the larynx and also they uh, uh, depress the larynx. Okay, so now we are going to look at the intrinsic laryngeal muscles. And we said the intrinsic laryngeal muscles are called intrinsic because both points of attachment, means origin and insertion, uh, are on the larynx itself. Um, these muscles contribute directly to moving the arytenoid cartilages so that you can adduct or abduct the vocal folds. Um, and also, uh, they uh, enable us to, some of them enable us to stretch the vocal folds to elevate pitch or to um, make the vocal folds shorter to lower pitch.
So the first one is the muscle that enables us to, to abduct the vocal folds, to take them away, away from the midline. So these are the posterior cricoarytenoid muscles or the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle. It depends on if you are referring to uh, the, two, uh, the two pieces of it, like left and right. It doesn't really matter. Or it's like my hands. I say the anatomy of the hand. Uh, this hand is the same as this hand. So if you study the anatomy of one, you study the anatomy of the other. So you can refer to the posterior cricoarytenoid as either the without the S or with the S. Generally, all laryngeal muscles are paired with the exception of the transverse laryngeal muscle that is only um, a, a single, uh, it doesn't have left and right. So the posterior cricoarytenoid, please do not make a mistake and, and call it anything else. If you simply just call it the cricoarytenoid, it means nothing at all because there is another muscle that has the same name. So you need to specify which muscle exactly that you are speaking about. So this one is his posterior. Uh, the muscles, if you click on this um, link, you are going to see an animation of each muscle and how it does its work. But look at this one. Here is the posterior view of the larynx. And uh, this, you have seen before, the anatomy of uh, the, the anatomy of the cricoid cartilage. The cricoid cartilage has a, an elevated um, uh, posterior end. And on top of that elevated posterior uh, end, you have the arytenoids. They sit here and they are uh, connected onto the superior facets of the arytenoid, of the cricoid cartilage. And this is the posterior lamina or surface of the cricoid cartilage. On either side of that, you're going to have a muscle that originates. And for this reason, we call it the posterior crico from cricoid and then arytenoid. So you understand it originates on the posterior surface of the cricoid and inserts onto the um, uh, posterior, on the posterior muscular process or the posterior surface of the muscular process of the arytenoid. So that when this muscle contracts, it's going to pull the, the arytenoid and swing it away from the midline. The other one will do the same. And in effect, you just you are opening, rotating the vocal folds away from the midline to open. This is the only muscle that is needed to open the vocal folds, to abduct the vocal folds, to perform laryngeal abduct, I mean, I mean arytenoidal abduction through moving the arytenoids away from each other or close to each other. And we said each arytenoid has a vocal fold that is attached to it. So when you swing the arytenoid this way, the vocal fold goes out. If you swing the arytenoid inward, the vocal fold goes toward the middle. So I ask you this question. Why is it that you need the one single muscle to abduct the vocal folds when you need several muscles to bring them together, to abduct them? You need to search find an answer for this question. It shouldn't be too difficult. Just use your mind to analyze. It should not be too difficult at all. But you need a single muscle the, to, to abduct the vocal folds to open them, uh, even though you need several muscles to, uh, to abduct them and compress them. So the, here is a, is a superior view of the vocal folds uh, of the larynx. And you can see here is a posterior view of the cr uh, posterior cricoarytenoid muscle, posterior cricoarytenoid muscle. So, and, and here is a superior view. This is what this muscle looks like if you look from above. Okay, so that is the posterior cricoarytenoid muscle. It comes from the surface of the cricoid cartilage and inserts on the posterior surface of the muscular process. This is the muscular process. And this is the poster <coughs> posterior surface of it. So now, <clears throat> there is another muscle that originates on the lateral margins, lateral superior margins of the cricoid cartilage and inserts onto the anterior, the anterior surface of the muscular process of the arytenoid on either side. Here's one and here's one. So you notice that it is exactly at the, uh, inserted on, it's exactly opposite of the, uh, in the insertion of the posterior cricoarytenoid. Okay, so this muscle is called the lateral, because it's on the superior lateral margins of the cricoid, the lateral cricoarytenoid muscle. This is why you really, really cannot make a mistake and just call this one or that one the cricoarytenoid. Uh, this actually, in this image, that is a, a wrong name. The cricoarytenoid is a wrong name, okay? And um, so make sure you call this muscle the lateral cricoarytenoid and this muscle the posterior cricoarytenoid and the lateral cricoarytenoid, when it 
contracts, it's going to swing, it's going to pull the muscular process in. And as a result, it will swing the entire arachnoid, it will swing it in toward the midline. So you imagine, pull here, and then that's going to swing the, um, the arachnoid inward to the midline. And that, you could see the vocal folds are connected onto the arachnoid. So this is the thyrovocalis of the uh, vocal fold and the thyromuscularis. So these two, both of them are going to be swung towards the midline. Lateral cricorinoid is the, the most powerful muscle of adduction, adduction. And then that muscle is assisted with, by the um, by the muscle that's like an X, I'm gonna back to it, this muscle here that is called the oblique arachnoid muscle. Oblique means at an angle, oriented or positioned at an angle. So it, that muscle is like an X, each branch of it is, is tilted and uh, the other ones like this. So when this muscle, uh, when both aspects, um, both um, branches of it, uh, contract, they end up closing closing the uh, uh, vocal folds, bringing them together, just like you have some, some pocket books, you know, have a mechanism like that to open and close. We'll explain this. But this is the muscle. And beneath um, uh, this muscle is the transverse that connects both arachnoids together. And that is the transverse from one side to the other. And posterior to it is that X-shaped muscle that is the oblique arachnid muscle. Sorry, the, the uh, slides sometimes are slow. So uh, the muscles of adduction are the lateral crack arachnoid, the oblique arachnoids, and the transverse arachnoids. The oblique arachnoids and the transverse are called together sometimes the intra-arachnoid muscles, okay? They're because they, they are in between the arachnoids. So, Okay, let me just go back a little bit, make sure. So here again is the oblique, and here is the transverse underneath it. The way that the oblique um, muscle works, um, the way that the oblique works, imagine that I have, um, Here's a vocal fold, here's one arachnoid, here's another arachnoid. The one oblique originates on the muscular process of one arachnoid, courses superiorly and inserts onto the tip or the apex of the opposite arachnoid. So going like that. And the other one also originates on the muscular process of the one arachnoid and courses to go on the other. So this is how they make that X. When they both contract, they bring the two tips, they bring the apex, the tops of the arachnoid cartilage together and the base also together. And, and so, so it makes them go like this, close like this, arachnoidal adduction. And in addition, this, the transverse, it, it connects the back of one arachnoid with the back of the other arachnoid. So when they move, they are just, that muscle just contracts and brings them together. So these two muscles are important for compression of the vocal folds and um, also to assist in the closure. They are innervated by the um, laryngeal, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve um, that comes out of the um, vagus nerve. So now I'm going to speak about how the vocal folds can 